recent years, investors have become accustomed to a world of very low interest rates and subdued inflation. But that looks set to change this year. How should we position our portfolios in a rising rate environment? To share with us more today, we have Bruce, Hui Xian, Jing Yan up on stage. Give them a round of applause and invite them up. Joining us here, first up, we have Bruce Zhang, Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at CSOP Asset Management. Hui Xian Kui, Director of the Product Strategy Team, Global Fixed Income Portfolio Management Group at BlackRock. Moderating this session is Cheng Jin Yen, Research Analyst of Research and Portfolio Management at IFA Singapore. Over to you, Jin Yen. Thank you and um, hi, good morning everyone and welcome to today's discussion. So um, joining me today are uh, Hui Xian and Bruce. So maybe we could start with a short introduction from maybe starting from you, Hui Xian. Sure, uh, my name is Hui Xian. Thanks for having me everyone and for attending. Uh, great cracking agenda, glad to be part of this. I look after the fixed income index and ETF business for BlackRock based in Singapore here. Um, so everything you've heard about iShares, um, especially when it comes to bond ETFs, um, is right up my street and I'm very excited to be talking about um, what to do with bonds today. Yeah, good morning everyone, uh, my name is uh, Bruce, I'm currently working at CSOP Asset Management as a fixed fix income portfolio manager, mainly covering the onshore China bonds as well as Singapore um, rates. So um, today I'm happy to share uh, more views on the back of the higher interest rates, thank you. Okay, so um, Bruce, at the start of the year, mm, the market consensus was maybe three rate hikes this year and another three next year. At least that was what happened in January. So um, obviously that has changed quite a bit and we have seen the interest rate hike expectation go up quite a lot. So um, maybe the question is, um, how did this escalate so quickly? Yeah, sure. I think to understand why the Fed is so aggressive this time, uh, we maybe uh, review the uh, different pr priorities of the Fed over different uh, time of periods. And since 2019, the, uh, the Fed's uh, monetary policies is mainly based on two factors. One is inflation and the other is the job market. But after the outbreak of the COVID-19, it's obviously the job market was the top priority. So at that time, the lower interest rate did support the growth as well as boost the core uh, inflation in a later stage. But however, uh, as the commodity prices started to accelerate, in particular um, early this year in the uh, Russian-Ukraine war, there was a mounting pressure which forces the Fed to hike sooner rather than later. And now the market actually expects the Fed uh, fund rate target range uh, to 2.75% or to 3% in 12 months period of time. But what we should care more about here, uh, about, uh, more here is that the BIPs hike of each time. Mm, because the lack of the 75 BIPs um, hike in the most recent decision <laughs> doesn't mean the zero possibility in the future because the Fed's uh, attitudes uh, towards the uh, tightening can be changed quickly if the data warrants it. Huisen, you got anything to add? I think you're spot on, um, but I think it's probably also useful to um, give some context on when you know, Jing Yan said, how did it es escalate so quickly? How quickly? We're talking about the past six months or less? Um, yeah, about right? six months. I think at the start of the year, rate hikes were pretty much very evident for the market, right? Actually, two, for two years, you have 0% in US bonds, something we've never seen before, but heralded as something that was needed to be done to, you know, to, to fight COVID. And now I think we're in a better place uh, because there's yields now, right? You need, you, need, you, you need yields for your bonds to generate income. Um, how did it escalate so quickly though? So I, get, I have some data here so I don't get my numbers wrong. Um, at the start of year, everyone thought 2022, three rate hikes, 25 basis points each. So you get to where, you know, one year you can at least earn 0.75%. Now, um, it's, it's all pretty much 
magnitudes higher. So I've, I've got here nine 25 basis points hikes expected for the year. That's consensus right now, nine times 25 just for the year. And what's actually happened just Wednesday is a 50 basis, uh, sorry, not just Wednesday, um, I think a few weeks ago now. So the, the latest FOMC Fed, Fed's meeting is 50 basis points. So the market is now keeping to push and push and push all the expectations. So just to put some context there. Short answer, um, uh, jobs and inflation. It's a balancing act, right? Um, without, um, um, the Fed needs to make sure this hike continues to go at a, uh, at a good pace without um, derailing um, jobs growth and the economic growth. But at the same time, they have this ugly rearing head of the, I wouldn't call it the, uh, the enemy, but if it's too high, it's definitely an enemy called inflation. Um, so post the, that, um, that hike, um, the markets kind of agree. And the markets actually agreed a lot earlier. The markets agreed in January where you know, the, the bond yields already started lifting off. So that's a, that's a very, very key point to, um, to, to acknowledge. Um, and I think, like I said, once bonds have hiked rates, we have income now, it's actually a good point to think about you know, the, the sell-off um, has, this, has it all been priced in? I think that's the key question going forward. So long story short, inflation to watch just a few days ago. CPI, the US one, still came in well above expectations. Um, so I think that's the, that's, that's the big question of um, the next few weeks or months um, that we need to look. Yeah, I, I think I totally agree <laughs> with your comments. I think another challenge we're facing here is that we are, we are in an environment mixed with both the epidemic and the war. And in peace times, the inflation uh, uh, pressure always came in. For example, that uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, employment, uh, it's, uh, unemployment rate is below the, the natural rate and or the GDP growth is above the so-called potential rate. But this time is quite different. Actually, the inflation started to accelerate uh, last year when the US jobless rate was still around 6%. And even a weaker than expected first quarter GDP for the US this year didn't prevent the Fed from aggressive uh, tightening. So uh, some of the investors attribute this to war. Um, of course, the, the last time we have seen this scale of war is perhaps the Korean War in 1950s or even World War II. At those times, the uh, employment or spending pattern were changed so rapidly so that the supply chain could not uh, keep up, which do, uh, did let, lead to some inflation. But this time, if you check the dispers uh, disruption level, it definitely was not as severe as it uh, was 70 years ago. So even the war itself uh, could not explain the faster inflation today. Okay, so we've maybe nine rate hikes this year, but a lot of the factors that we've mentioned today, war, um, oil prices, they are largely out of control of the US Fed, right? So how successful will these rate hikes be in managing this inflation? Um. If I knew, there'd be a crystal ball. <laughs> the Fed really has a really tough job. Um, it's rightly normalizing its policy. When I say normalizing, years of 0% bonds not paying you anything is not normal. Um, but they will need to slam the brakes. They will need to stop raising rates if inflation gets out of hand. Um, so it's very tough to see the perfect outcome, actually, which is why, even though it's rising rates is not good for bonds, we're in, a play, we're in a time where it's not necessarily good for equities either, because the perfect outcome is low inflation and then growth like humming along um, nicely. Um, but where we are now, because of the supply chain, that's frankly never happened before to Bruce's point um, in this magnitude, means we have to endure inflation um, or, 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 or a higher than normal than historical rates of inflation. Um, so the Fed, we believe, success looks like keeping the rates at maybe, is it 2, is it 2.5, is it 3? That's the golden question. Um, the neutral rate that won't derail the economy nor um, make inflation um, go worse. So that's kind of how we look at it. Like a tightrope, yeah, basically. 
Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think there's no easy way <laughs> to fight against the inflation. And first of all, the inflation is driven by both the supply and demand. And I believe the current fact tightening could somewhat uh, help curb the inflation or at least curb the speculation on commodity prices. But it was noting that the fat tightening uh, could only impact inflation from the demand side at the very beginning with risk uh, 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 lowering the growth, as I mentioned, right? Uh, but, it, but from the supply side, it takes time to transmit this to the production side. And the, the immediate uh, supply side pressure uh, is a bit out of the Fed control. And obviously, the Russian-Ukraine war did boost both energy prices as well as the food prices. And the, another factor which cannot be downplayed is China's productivity as the nation is still a partially locked down, uh, which doesn't only impact its domestic demand, but also impact its supply chain, which adds more inflation pressure uh, globally. So in the near term, we may still facing some uh, inflation pressure ev uh, despite the Fed tightening. Okay, so with, I would say that rate hikes are basically inevitable in the rest of 22 at this point. So um, we move on to fixed income, which is naturally affected by rising rates. So bonds and rates have an inverse relationship. So when rates go up, bond prices go down. So what are the implications for investors in this case? So how should investors navigate this kind of environment? Uh, I like that Bruce uh, took China into the conversation. Even China bonds um, is now uh, quite investable for, for investors, which wasn't the case a few years ago. Um, and it's now no longer a market we can ignore, um, nor sitting here in Asia or the global investors that we've, we've been talking to. Um, but generally, US bonds, China bonds, any bonds doesn't like inflation. Uh, so inflation is not good um, for bonds. However, um, I, I, especially for holistic multi-asset allocators, we all hold a bit of bonds, a bit of equities, a bit of cash, a bit of property. Um, we remain generally, I guess, underweight bonds for that very good reason. Important note though, rates have risen, right? Rate rising means bond uh, prices dropping, but the big question is, has that already all been priced in? Um, because of the dramatic moves this year, it's already risen. Um, so is it time to enter? Um, so I would actually um, stress that, you know, even though you maybe dial down bonds a bit or stay on the sidelines on your fixed income allocation, importantly, we, um, we want to remain invested, right? Um, I, I think that's that's the key. If I if I leave with you here, and then the, this year's dramatic rate hikes has restored a lot of value, right? You get two three percent depending on which bonds you're choosing um, now, and that's your cushion, that's your protection, that's your ballast in your portfolios. Um, and one very good reason Bruce mentioned as well, right? Bonds don't like inflation, but right now equities don't seem to like it either. Um, the downside risk um, has increased because commodities price will hit growth for US and Europe. And I'm going to repeat what you said. And at the same time, COVID is still hitting China. So global growth is not looking rosy at the moment. Um, so if anything, it's time to look at adding back to bonds, at least from my point of view. Um, the investors who have done well for the past six months would have dealt down bonds and then now are looking to add, back, to add that dry powder back to some protection in your portfolio. Um, but in terms of well, what we're seeing, so I look at all the iShares, we have 100 over bond ETFs, you can kind of look at the flows of what are people doing. Um, we see uh, people adding back to short duration. So short duration meaning kind of one year, two year type of bond safe, um, which has gone from no yield to now more than 2% yield. So just, you know, it's, it's like, you know, a bit more than fixed deposit, it's just a matter of whether it's all priced in. Um, we see investors still shy, still not taking the longer end, right? So it's a, if it's 10 year bond, um, it should pay you a bit more, but not simply not enough. Investors are demanding so much more compensation. If I'm gonna lend you money for 10 years or if I'm, if I'm gonna buy a 10 year bonds either in US or China, I need to be compensated for inflation on the US side or the growth outlook on the China side. No, so no one's doing that yet, at least from what, from what we can see on the flows, which uh, makes a lot of sense. So the ETF flows are good to watch. Um, they, are, they are becoming a good barometer for what bond investors are doing. Um, and looking across um, asset classes where I think it makes sense now, 
um, is where the cushion is the highest. So I, I, I mentioned short duration already. The curve is super flat now in the US, um, where um, the two year is also above 2%, the 10 year is 3%, that, that term premium um, is incredibly flat. Um, so, so just just to give you a sense of what you can get um, uh, in terms of income now in your portfolio. Yeah, I definitely echo your view. <laughs> the investors should stay uh, invested in the bond market instead of liquidating all of your um, fixed income assets because the bond uh, still provides stable uh, income, relatively low volatility, and the potential diversification benefits. But on the back of rising um, rate uh, interest rate environment, I would highlight three uh, major risks uh, so that investors could fine tune their fixed income uh, allocation then. Uh, uh, this is uh, namely the uh, credit default risk and also the FX risk as well as the duration risk as you mentioned. And first uh, first risk is the credit default risk. Of course, uh, each bond issuer's uh, default uh, risk potential is linked more to its own uh, growth outlook as well as its own uh, credit robustness. But it's quite natural to imagine the higher interest rate could lead potential higher borrowing cost which could, also, of course, uh, lead to some potential higher uh, default risk. So the risk-averse investors could definitely um, increase its uh, credit quality of their portfolios or be more selective in terms of liquidity and uh, potential uh, default risk when picking uh, bonds in the high-yield space. And the second risk is the foreign exchange risk. It's also quite straightforward as the dollar strength may erode your total return if you invest in non-dollar um, assets. So in this scenario, investors may increase their allocations to dollar-denominated fixed income assets or hedge their um, FX exposure if their underlying bonds is, uh, is non-US dollar. And lastly, uh, it's about the duration risk, you already mentioned a bit, is that uh, it, it is also true for the, for the US Treasury, which already uh, denominated in US dollar, no more um, dollar FX risk, because the long duration multiplied by the higher yield can still uh, negatively impact the bond price uh, significantly. So the investor would definitely shorten their duration or even adopt a buy and hold approach. And alternatively, investor could uh, explore some fixed income, fixed income market with decent yield or, uh, or still keep, have some room to keep a relatively supportive monetary policy. Okay, so fixed income is important as it traditionally has been uh, as a defensive aspect and diversification and all that. So. Now for the tough questions, I guess. So maybe we will start with Hussein. So what is your highest conviction fixed income idea for the rest of 2022? That's actually not tough at all. That's my favorite question so far. Um, uh, I guess the tough question is, you know, uh, what will what the Fed needs to do to not derail stuff. To Bruce's point, all those risks of yields hiking can just reverse if the central banks slam, slam their brakes. That means yields will come back down. But personally, um, candidly, I hope we don't see that because the past two years was not fun. There was simply no yields, which is not how bonds are supposed to work. Um, staying invested is key. Um, so my, when I look at, you know, out of all the 100 or so ETFs we could, we could do or we could design our bond allocations today, Two years ago, it was a no-brainer. I would just sit here and tell you it's um, China because renminbi was strong. China was still paying, uh, again, 2.5%, 3% income. Um, right now, that's jittery. The renminbi is corrected a little bit. But at the same time, the US uh, market is now paying income, um, and the USD is strong. That was the opposite view two years ago. So just very simplistically painting the picture on both sides. Um, Right now, for fixed income investors as a bond, wearing my bond hat, I'm in a more, I'm in a nicer position because I have choice now. Um, but my implementation for 2022 at least is not either or anymore. It's probably a combination, right? Diversification, if that's the golden rule for your portfolio. Um, I think that's becoming increasingly clear for me. Very much like the supply chains, right? We see people needing to localize their supply chain, protect it a little bit more. So, in, so people are developing a home bias, needing to make it more resilient. Same thing as portfolios. I think we're seeing our investors being a lot more deliberate with the global bond and the home biases they have in their portfolios. 
So example, um, if it's a China, I think we're both fans of that, so if it's a China renminbi bond ETF plus a US dollar bond ETF, you get your risk um, that diversifies each other. They are uncorrelated because the economy is being driven, as we mentioned just now, as very different factors. But both sides still pay you, hopefully, um, 2 to 3% income today, which was zero on one side, something on the other side. Um, when you combine these, when you look at them um, from more from an aggregate level, that's what we like. That's what we like bonds to do for us. You get a low volatility outcome, um, but still a chance of positive potential real yield type of returns for the next foreseeable future. Because I'm not going to pick either side. Both sides are super uncertain and more. Both sides are not giving me enough conviction to go 100% each for my bond portfolio, bond allocation at least, but still can protect me from any equity um, scares. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I really loved Huisin's idea is to combine the both the dollar assets and the renminbi assets. And obviously, the dollar assets is uh, favored for now. Um, just as I mentioned, the short tenor, the treasury bond or the IG credit, invest I can either buy uh, buy them uh, through an ETF vehicle or even holding them to maturity to lock the yield. And also, the high yield is not a forbidden area <laughs> as long as investor can consider both the liquidity risk as well as the default risk. And in terms of the onshore China government bonds, I have to say that Renminbi was not immune to the current Fed tightening as we saw here over the past months. The Renminbi also dropped a lot. But it's not only because of the narrow, narrow the negative carry, but also because of the country's um, current lockdown situation. But just as you mentioned, things can change. But if, if, if in the second half, China managed to overcome this difficulty, and the nation will benefit uh, from more effective monetary policy, and the Renminbi may get back its fundamental support in the global recovery, then we will be still uh, constructive on the onshore China government bonds. And lastly, um, also uh, recommend rates. This is something uh, between fixed income and equities, uh, in particular for those large cap liquid at Singapore rates, because they are benefiting uh, from the ongoing reopening for, uh, for of the Singapore economy. They also have dominant assets right, in, in Singapore to raise rent to outperform the inflation. And on the other hand, they also have some diversified debt profile across the fixed and uh, floating uh, debts across different maturity years. So they are more defensive to the current rising uh, in interest rate, rate uh, environment. My rent is definitely increasing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, other than long duration, which is the obvious answer, what should investors avoid then? Sure. Uh, oh, avoid. Okay, avoid, uh, that's, that's, yes. that's a good um, ad 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 adaptation. To, I wouldn't say to avoid, but I would say over the past few months, the frequently asked question um, is, hey, Hui Xian, well, how come I bought inflation-linked bonds, but I haven't made money um, whilst inflation's gone up? Uh, so I would say it's a great asset class. We like inflation-linked bonds, over, especially over longer duration rates exposures, but um, it takes a bit more homework to know when to get in and when how tips work, treasury inflation protected um, securities. Um, because these things are still susceptible to rates rise, as susceptible to rates rise as nominal bonds, and then on top of that, they will compensate you for uh, inflation beating expectations. So just because inflation is trending upwards does not mean your uh, TIPS ETF will definitely uh, be positive. It simply gives you more of a cushion versus the rate hikes all of us are susceptible to. Um, so I wouldn't say that's a place to avoid. I would say that's a, a, a smarter play, but a harder play um, to make sure you generate positive income uh, for your portfolio, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can't agree, agree more. I also want to mention the tips because uh, the inflation-linked bonds can definitely provide some uh, inflation protection, but it, it also subject to the interest rate risk, which means the current Fed tightening can also negatively impact the um, the, the, the tips the price, even the inflation is uh, rising up. And even I'm a fixed income uh, portfolio manager, I won't say we should avoid all the riskier assets, but I, I just want to expand uh, a little bit more from your answers is that the, 
uh, on the back of the high um, in, uh, inflation environment, there are some talkings about anti-inflation assets like tips or even gold. Of course, the gold has anti-inflation features as well, but the gold is denominating in US dollar, which means the dollar strength can also erode the gold prices. And secondly, the gold, unlike bonds, they can't, cannot yield coupon or mini gold. And also the gold cannot generate power like oil, right? So they, they, may, they, may, not, they may not be able to start my car today. <laughs> so, um, but even if we talk about the broad-based commodities, it definitely does not only uh, include oil. For example, the iron ore prices, they started to struggle after the China's uh, regulatory crackdown on its uh, property um, sector. And even we talk about the oil itself, the, the higher oil, oil price, it's a driver of inflation instead of a result of the inflation. And the current high price of the oil, also subject to the rapidly changing um, that dynamics of the supply and demand, so investors should be more cautious. I mean, you can see the slight different traits here. It's more credit default <laughs> risk and commodities and more steady fixed income. I just want something fixed and a lot of income. <laughs> Well, um, I think that seems to me like a good place to wrap up with like you guys sharing your ideas of what to invest in. So a bit of REITs, a bit of a diversified US-China portfolio, as well as what to avoid, which um, seems to be tips and gold and certain resources that might be vulnerable to the strength of the USD. Yep. So as always, I think you have also stressed this multiple times that diversification remains very important for investors. And also remember to keep duration low to avoid being hit by rate hikes in your long duration portfolios. Yep. So once again, thank you. And um, please do, um, for our guests today, please do put in your questions into the Q&A segment and we'll, be tr and we'll try our best to answer them. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.